Oh, it's on. Tessie. Okay, cool. Good morning. Hey, uh, what an amazing night last night. Were you here? If you weren't, you need to get online and invest 28 minutes of your day. That's about all he preaches. I told him uh, he's younger than me. I got to learn that. All right? He knocked it out of the park in about 28 minutes, but we had a powerful night of a night of victory. We're doing one month, once a month night of victory. Now, I, I was ministering Wednesday night with uh, Brother Jerry Porter, and um, we did a tag team. You can, I mean, that was an absolute, uh, what you would call contrast. I mean, it was chocolate and vanilla straight up, and I was white, and he was him, and man, we, I, you know, I, I, we got out opened, he ministered, uh, I got up, I ministered, he closed, and man, powerful service last Wednesday, but um, Last night was something I had never seen before. He, he was at another level walking in here. And the word that he gave last night was phenomenal. I'm telling you if, you, if you need a boost of faith right now, jump online. 28 minutes is all his part was. Jump on there and go. Then he prophesied over everybody in here. Like, I loved it. What a great night. Um, we do those Saturday nights once a month on purpose because going into this year, I feel like the Lord said there are going to be people going through stuff that just need a little extra boost. You know, I don't know, but in my truck, well, I don't do it right now because it's liquid gold, right? But used to every once in a while, just for no reason, when I pulled up to the pump, I would hit the 93 octane button on um, purpose to put the good gas in. Y'all ever done that? Usually run on regular gas, but every once in a while you throw the good gas in just to give that motor a clean and all that. That's what I feel like these Saturday nights are, just a boost. And so if you're going through something this year, once a month, we're going to do a night of victory, and we're going to get the best of the best in here to carry us to another level. Amen? Amen. So then I'll say this. We're going tonight to Monroe, and Brother Jerry Porter will be with us. He's been preaching somewhere almost every night this week, but he's given us tonight to uh, be in Monroe. And I'm excited about it. You can see, I want to tell everybody that's been praying with us online and praying with us on, in person, thank you for doing it. I was talking to Sister Doris um, after uh, when we separated, I left Monroe, headed toward Alabama last Sunday night, and I got her on the phone. And it was you know, last night we went and um, last night we went and we took the ministry door to door. And in the process of going door to door, you guys have been praying, Katrina, Tamika, Doris. I mean, I'm not meaning not to call her by Lorenzo. All those that have been praying in this thing, it, w- it was a small group of us in a room for the last six months. If they wasn't in the room, they were online. And it was, what I saw in the spirit was like we were hitting a slab in the city. Now, if you're any old school construction workers in here, before you could go to Hayes Rental and rent a uh, jackhammer to bust up slabs, I grew up working on a crew with my dad. And what he would do on days that we had to bust slabs up, he would bring us and he would put several of us on a circle and we would take sledgehammers and we would swing and hit them and hit right in the middle of that slab. Now, he didn't want you to hit them with the tip of the sledgehammer to chip anything out. He wanted you just to hit it flat as best you can. And so it would be boom, boom, boom. And, man, you would, we would be doing that for hours. And Dad said, like, keep doing it. Y'all keep doing it. And he would go do it. Dad, keep doing it, keep doing it. And a lot of times I didn't understand the process of it. But what was taking place on the inside there, couldn't see on the outside. But it was amazing when I learned the concept of what he was teaching us to do is because eventually we just kept hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. It didn't look like we would have a little divot right there after a couple hours, but it would always happen if we kept hitting that thing. It was like all at once there would be a (laughs) and the the slab would just shatter apart. And then we could take it out in pieces. And... That's what I felt like we've been doing for the first of this year in Monroe was hitting, hitting, hitting. And last Sunday when we pulled up there, Yvette and Joyce, you know, they, we all pulled up at the um, community center. And when I was driving in, there were these teenage boys playing football. So I drove past them and I heard God say, you got to talk to these boys. So I pulled my car right up to where they were and I said, you know, we're going to do this. I got to go talk to them guys. And I know it was odd and rude of me. I know that I just took off, didn't know where everybody was going, didn't know the plan. But as I was getting closer to these boys, here come this giant from across the street. He's a big man. And 
I knew this was, he was watching these boys and watching over them. So I turned and went and talked to him. And that's as far as I got that whole night. The next two hours, I was there. And then I pulled everybody else in too. But the divine appointments that began to work there. Number one, his wife was in church that morning. And they announced in their church the event we're throwing tonight. How awesome is that? They're going to be joining with us there. How crazy. All right, but then... Not only that, um, the man, me and him were talking, kind of find out he is the assistant director of the Washtenaw Parish Juvenile Detention Center. He's second in charge. While I was sitting there talking with him, his boss called. And he talked to everybody. He told his boss, I got this guy there in a church, and, and we got to have them in our facility. So he's invited Victory to come and do services in the Washtenaw Juvenile Parish Center there with hundreds of kids. Well, you can't buy that. Do you understand? You can't buy that. Not only that, that's not just touching kids. What that is to me is hundreds of families in Monroe in a desperate point believing God to move on their kids' behalf. And God's allowing us to step inside that center and not just minister to these boys, but I'm going to say that I was wondering what's my niche here because I'm not trying to pastor Monroe. We're raising up pastors. I told everybody there, I'm not, I can't do it. I want to support who's going to be there. And so I was like, what's my niche here? What's my, and Lord, I'm going to start building a, a support ministry for parents that got them kids in. Because i got to be honest with you, if my kid's locked up, that's where my heart will be every day. And so we're going to have the opportunity to minister to every one of those families and see that city turn around. It's like we've been hitting in prayer and hitting in prayer, and all of a sudden at once, it just shattered. We got... I'm saying this is 10 years down the road. It takes churches to get into facilities like that all in one divine appointment. Not because we were at the right place at the right time, but it's because we've spent weeks establishing prayer. And in that one thing, to make up, all right, his wife is a social worker in the city for the orphans in the city. Almost every people we've been praying for in those prayer meetings, the fatherless, those that have, you know what I'm saying, fallen off the way, those that the unwanted, the undesirables, those that have, the enemy has already entered in and destroyed their lives. We've been calling and praying over those. And in one moment, that door opened. And now we're going to be able to walk in and bring Jesus into something. So pray to God. I'm pumped about that. And that is so awesome. All right. So, uh, give honor where honor is due. Happy birthday, Wade. <laughs> it's Wade's birthday today. How cool is that? <laughs> Come to church on your birthday. Yeah, millennials, they say this, uh, this new generation, millennials, when they, you interview them for a job, it's a prerequisite. They get their birthday as a holiday off, all right? And so it's amazing that, you know, when you come to church on your birthday, thank you for putting God first on your day. I'm believing for many, many more. I'd sing it for you, but it ruined your birthday. <laughs> um, trying to think of any other announcements you've uh, got going on. Can't think of them. Y'all ready to jump into something? Yeah. Um, See, I've been an emotional wreck. I know y'all think y'all got a crying preacher. I'm not a crier, man. That's not who I really am. Uh, Jennifer wishes I would show emotion. She says, I have two emotions. I'm either fine or I'm mad. And uh, usually I'm mad. Right? <laughs> but, uh, man, I'm not just trying to um, preach this stuff. This stuff is happening in me, too. Okay? So... Last night I was grilling, uh, getting ready for tonight. We were getting Boston Butts ready, and someone walked up to me and said, you know what today is? And I said, no. And uh, he said, it's uh, so-and-so's birthday. Well, I don't want to use names roughly, but I'm just going to lay it out for you real quick because it takes us where we're going today. There's a gentleman that about, I guess, five to six years ago, it's hard to believe that there's people in America now that have never been in churches. But I met one about five or six years ago. There was a gentleman in town that had never been to church. And we had invited him. It was a Father's Day. And we were having a grill competition. And he came. We were having a Father's Day grill off, giving $500 prize away. to. We brought in a judge. We brought in the police chief. And we brought in the fire chief. And they were our judges. And this guy had never been in church. But he came to that service. Because he wanted to grill, and he wanted to win the 500 one. He didn't care about the 500, really, but he wanted to 
win and show off that he could grill. And in the process of that service, though, he came in and meant beelined it down to right here and just collapsed and wept and wept and gave his heart to the Lord. Now, he comes from what I call the roughest family in this city. And his life was an absolute wreck and shambles. There wasn't a sin that he wasn't involved in. Full, addicted to, I mean, almost every kind of drug you can imagine. Alcoholic from the time he could remember. And there's very few times I ever saw him sober. Over the last five, six years, me and him built a relationship to the point where he even introduced me into his family. And um, I sit with his father many, many times. And over the last five or so years, every time, a, for about a year, though, from that service, he would come just about every Sunday. And if you were here with us at that time, you would see him laying right here, uncontrollably weeping and sobbing, uncontrollably. And, man, I'd prayed with him, I'm telling you, at least 20, 25 times during that process. But he'd get up and he'd go back out. And he wasn't a doubt he loved God immensely. But his life was still broken at such a level. I know he was saved. I prayed with him multiple times. He wanted to keep making sure he was saved. Right? But he kept going back out involved in a world of just destruction. Drugs and alcohol had destroyed their life to a point that you almost couldn't recognize these guys in this family anymore. They were very, their father was a construction guy here in town was a very successful construction guy, and they had amassed millions. They had me, but you would look at them and never know there were millions there. Um, but they were worth a lot of money. So money was not, I want you to know something, money's not going to fix your issues. And so they would take money, and it would keep them bound in what they were bound into. And over the course, about two years ago, their, well, their father caught cancer and got cancer, and they brought me in to talk to the dad because they were give, pretty much giving the dad a death sentence. So I got to go over and I got to lead their father to the Lord in their house sitting around a kitchen table. And I was so thankful for that opportunity. The house that they had, if you, I'll just say the house. It was, it was the big house that was behind McDonald's. It's known in this city pretty much as the drug addict and the alcoholic living quarters of this city. Pretty much any day of the week, that's where you could go and you could find people that you would thought were desolate. And, but the owners of that place was multimillionaires. You're talking about missing God at that time. They offered that house to me for 35000 for us to turn it into a drug rehab. And um, I uh, didn't have enough faith for thirty five, And they were going to own the finance. I turned them down. A year later, he sold it to Marriott <laughs> for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And... That's where the Fairfield is now. But over the course of, like, say, the next five, six years, I was a part and got to be involved with this family multiple times. And, man, they were so sincerely getting saved. But they were so broken and addicted. And, man, when the father died, they had no other preacher in their life. And so they called me to come and do the funeral. So I was, it was an honor for me to do it. Because I got to tell the whole family there, I was there the day, sitting at the kitchen table when the father gave his heart to the Lord. And I know where he was. Even though it looked like God hadn't done anything in his life. But then the son inherited all this money, millions. And over the next year, that millions took his life at a level like I had never seen sin escalate at that level. When I was at the father's funeral, we had very coherent conversations. In the next year, drugs, alcohol, abuse had destroyed this man's life to the point where he'd gotten put in a nursing home because he had pretty much become a vegetable in his brain. I got called by a chaplain one day to come over to the nursing home to pray with him because the son had mentioned that he would like me to come pray with him because I knew he was about to die. So I went over and we prayed again and he gave his heart back to the Lord, and, you know, everything got right. Then I got a call about two weeks later to come over, and they wanted, his girlfriend wanted me to marry him. But 
I mentally, cognitively, he was already gone, so I wouldn't do it. They were after the money. Then they actually, if you were here about a year and a half ago, in one of our services, the girlfriend brought him up here. You couldn't even really recognize him in the apartment. Wanted me to marry him right then because he only had to get in just a couple of days later, he died. I'm telling you that story for this. Yesterday was his birthday. And that's what the person walked up to me and said, you know what day it is? It's so-and-so's birthday. He said, do you think he's in heaven? I said, I know he is. I was there when he did exactly what it took, the Bible says, to have Jesus pay the price for his sins. And the question was, but then why did his life never change? Well, because the truth is this. You can be saved and still be a mess. You can be saved and still be broken. You can be saved in a wreck. Today we're starting the process of what we're calling Kairos. I've been preaching Kairos messages over the last several weeks, and you've heard Kairos stories, testimonies. But we're going to start the process through Kairos. Today's I'm titling it Family um, Fractured Foundations, Family Matters. And so I'm going to jump right in it. I'm going to preach a short message at first, and then we're going to go through some process, all right? So... If uh, you're thinking this is weird, this is about weird it's going to get. But to me, if it's got to be normal and normal's not working, man, it goes weird with me. You know, God, do whatever you want to, all right, man? Just if, you, if you're questioning some things, let's just I ask you just to bear with me for a bit, okay? Kairos is a moment that changed everybody. I want to start reading in Mark chapter 5. And it says this, And they went across to the lake, to the region of the, of the garrison. Gerasians. Now, if you jump, I'm, I'm ADD, so you're going to have to bear. I'm, if you go back to chapter 4, you ain't got to go there. I'm just going to reference. If you go back to chapter 4, this is the story where Jesus steps into the boat and says, let's go to the other side. They started sailing, and a great storm came up against them. And all the disciples were afraid, and Jesus was asleep on the boat. And Jesus stepped up out and said, peace be still, and the storm stopped. But then they got to the other side. And so we're picking up right where they just came through this terrible storm. It says, and they went across to the, re- to the, went across the lake to the region of the Gadareans. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often, and I'm on, I'll mention words through here if, you wanna, if you're an underliner or just reference in your mind. We're going to visit in a bit. It says, for often he had been chained hand and foot. That often is a pretty important word for where we're going to go back to here in a bit. It says, often he'd been chained. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No man was strong enough to subdue him. And if you're another reference, is no man. It says, night and day among the tombs in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. It says, when he saw Jesus at a distance, that distance is a pretty amazing word. We'll come back there. And he said, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want me to do, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. And Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. And a large herd of pigs was feeding in the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits went out into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake, and were drowned. Were is another very important word here. Were. Okay? It says, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town, the town's countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by legions of demons sitting there depressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Right mind's an important one. Those who had seen it, told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told, the, told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus 
to leave their region. Weird response. If Jesus was setting our kids free, would you ask him to leave? And Jesus was getting into the boat, and the man who had, demon, who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him go. That's very important. But he said, go home to your own people, very important, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Mercy is very important. So, that, so the man went away and began to tell the disciples how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. I'm going to jump in just real quick and preach a preachery message right here real quick. I love this story, how it kicks off, but we're talking about foundational issues. Do I got any golfers in the room? Anybody got any, golfer, any golfers? I'm not a golfer. Uh, with churches and things that I've worked for in the past, a lot of the staffs were into golf. I grew up in Arkansas. I never saw the point in hitting a white ball in a hole. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't into golf, so, and I never got any good at it. And the reason I never got any good at it because I never was taught the fundamental principles of swinging right and doing, you know, hitting the ball right. So I just rear back and give it everything I got. And 90% of the time, it would not go straight. So most of my game was always played called best ball. Whoever hits the best ball, I'm going to drop mine right beside yours, and we're going to play from there. And so the, these guys that really want to get good at golf, they take time. And they let somebody teach them, even Tiger Woods, who is the very best golfer in the world. He just got indicted into the Hall of Fame. You saw that last week. It's pretty cool. And, um, but he has a, a putting coach that works on him constantly and has been with him through his whole career because uh, he, Tiger Woods knows this. The foundations of the game will determine the success and level he makes it to in the sport. And so Tiger Woods was always working on his. In baseball, I don't, anybody baseball players in here? You know, I tried that. I was bad. And so uh, there are certain sports I just wasn't good at. But when I started trying to learn to play baseball, our coach, he would try to teach us right off at the very beginning the proper stance and the way. And we would spend like a week or two every learning the, the principle because if you're standing too close to the base and they throw a ball, then, you know what I'm saying, they're going to put it in the zone, and you're going to mess up. If you're standing too far in it, they throw a ball in the zone, you're going to miss out on being able to hit some of the things that would be in a perfect... I mean, the fundamentals, even Michael Jordan, the entire time he was learning to play basketball, he constantly kept going back to the fundamentals, the foundations of how to play because it determined the success or the level he would have in the sport. We're calling today fractured foundations because a lot of us try to become and do what God has called us to become and do, but we never understand that our foundations that we started with have such a great impact on how far or how great or how big we can build in the fulfilling what God has done for us. And so before we can move further in anything, we've got to go back and deal with our foundations, and this is the truth. All of our foundations starts with family matters. Your very foundation of everything in your life is connected down to the family relationships that you were born into. Your, or, your family origin, the one that you were birthed into, plays such a major role in how far you're going to go into this life. And I'm not talking about how much money they have in the bank. The gentleman I just told you about had millions in the bank when he died. It's not the right side. It is the foundation that God intended each one of us to start with. Now, in this story, I love this, that if we go start going through this message, I want you to know, man, just yesterday, the enemy tried to come on me with such guilt and shame. I called my daughter three times trying to repent and fix some things in her life because, see, God put her in my life and she didn't get to choose her dad. But the truth is, I'm a part of her foundation. And if I'm fractured, it wounds her. And so I love this Jesus in this story. Before he even got to the other side, 
The Bible says he was on the, in verse 4, he was on the side of the other sea ministering to thousands. And he got in a boat and went through thousands, I mean, went through tons of pressure and hardship and storm that the disciples thought were going to kill him. But Jesus was going to the other side and he wasn't going there to minister to thousands. Because the Bible said this, he only got out of the boat, he ministered to one, then he got back in the boat. I'm telling you to tell you this. God will go to any length just for you. And you say, well, God, why, why would you let me end up there in the first place? That's what I want to under, I break down here today. Is why this guy was demon-possessed. But before we get there, you need to know that Jesus was not okay with leaving him that way. And God had a purpose and a plan. And any time God has a purpose and a plan, it's only a matter of time before the story turns. And so Jesus went all the way over there for just one. You are that important to God. And this guy was messed up. Had thousands of demons on the inside of him. He wasn't too far gone that Jesus wasn't willing to go too far out to get. So we're going to start that way there. But then it says this. It says that Jesus impacted him and had a major influence. Now, let me address the issue of demons. Um, demons are real. It's amazing. 80% of the church today in a statistic by Barna believes that there's n- the devil's not real and demons aren't real. They believe in God, but I'm here to tell you, if you believe in God, you better know there's a devil. And demon activity is real. And you say, well, Craig, I don't believe that. Well, then you need to understand that when you're having feelings and you're having battles and emotions like depression, that there's demons and the enemy is attacking you and trying to influence. The Bible says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The Bible says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. That means that fear is a spirit. All right, there are demons and devils. And you say, well, where did they come from? There was one devil. His name is Lucifer. He was an archangel. He built up a, a, um, a resistance or a rebellion against God. He wanted to be God. wanted the worship that they were giving God. The Bible says one-third of all the angels followed him. And so when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, so were one-third of the angels. And so the devil's not here by himself. He's got minions working with him. And their main goal in life is to destroy you. The story here in the Bible about the demons when they were cast out shows us what a devil or a demon's intention is for you. All right, so the Bible says that when Jesus came to him, the demons that were in his life didn't want to be cast in. One over in another book, it says, into a dry place. Didn't want to be cast out and sent to a dry place. So he said, let us go into the pigs. And that's weird that Jesus let them go into the pigs. And there's all kind of theological here because these Jewish people shouldn't have had these pigs in any other place. They they had sin. They were compromising. Jewish Jews weren't supposed to touch pigs. They were unclean. But they were raising pigs for profit. And so there was compromise in this whole area. But so a lot of people preach that Jesus let these pigs go in. The demons go into these pigs to take care of their sin. And but I don't believe that. Because when you read into the, other, the rest of the story, it says when he put, let them go into the pigs, it says the pigs ran down a steep bank and they ran into the water. And it says, and they were drowned. Now, did you know pigs can swim? There's an island in the Bahamas that have wild pigs in it. I was going to get the video up for you, but I was putting stuff on the grill between service. But you can Google it. But that people go to this island because it's an island with all kind of wild pigs on it. And the pigs get up every day and they swim. And they go, you know, there's not enough food on this. They swim and find different food around and they swim back to this one. Pigs can swim. So why did these pigs drown? They did not drown. They, it says that they were drowned. If they would not have been able to dr- swim, it would have said that the pigs ran into the water and drowned. But it says were. Meaning that somebody did it to them. I believe Jesus sent these demons into these pigs so that we and the people there would know what the demon and the devil's plans are for your life 
if we don't address them and deal with them. The Bible says they have come to steal, kill, and destroy. Those pigs were murdered, and that was the plan that the devil had for that young man, but Jesus showed up and set him free. Amen. The devil don't play games. And this boy, this young man, he wasn't the one in charge of the pigs. It was the people in the village and the other people there. So we can't say that he was demon-possessed because he was the one in sin raising pigs. But it can tell me this. When they asked Jesus to leave, when he was setting their kids free, it lets me know they loved their pigs more than they loved Jesus. A lot of times people can love their pigs more than they love what God is wanting to do in their lives. And so here we got this story of this man that was demon-possessed. And the plan for the enemy is to steal, kill, and destroy. To rob your life of all that God has for it. To destroy your marriage. To put your kids into a, a loss and no hope generation. So my question is, why or how did this kid get demon-possessed? You say, okay, I don't believe in demon possession. That word is not necessarily in this text. It said there were, he, he was, um, had unclean spirits. The word possession has a couple meanings in the New Testament. One means I own you, ownership. And the other means under the influence of or in control of. Okay, so I don't want to get into the theology kind of stuff. I just want you to know that demonic spirits are real. But the thing about it is they like to hide in plain sight. And in another way of them hiding, they do it through familiarity. There's a scripture that says there are familiar spirits. And so I want to break down some things today and hopefully move us into a point of Kairos, a moment that's fixing change all moments today. I can't manufacture this stuff. I don't know if you will experience one today or not, but I know this. Um, the opportunity is going to be here. So how did he get demon-possessed? Well, let's look back and see what it, how it describes him. The Bible says that they would often put chains on him and bind him. It means that this young man had been through some trauma. They had been through some abuse. He had been through some things that he did not like or want or even probably deserve. And the circumstances he'd been through had put him in a place of woundedness. Now let me explain a wound, okay? A wound is not a cut. A wound is a cut that's not treated. When you don't treat a cut, what happens? It stays open, and things that aren't supposed to be in it get in it. And they affect it not in a positive way. They affect it in a bad way to the point where it will bring, begin to bring death to the areas of that wound. So this guy had been through some stuff. They would bind him, it called it. They would chain him. And it says, no man. So I, it was done by people. No man was able to subdue him. People were trying to. People were trying to control him. People were trying to manipulate the situation. People were trying to get him under control. I'm sure that's what they thought. But in the process, it opened up doors for things that were not supposed to be in his life to get in. Causing trauma to become wound. And when trauma becomes wound... What takes place is now the enemy has a place in your life to work. There's a scripture that says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil another translation. In the translation, it says, a place. Don't give the devil a place. Well, what do you... That means while he was 
under the attack and wounded from what had taken place and the traumas in his life, his mind was not right. But by the encounter with Jesus, his mind got right. All right? Then it says he wanted and realized he had destiny because he wanted to start following and going with Jesus. But Jesus said, you can't. He said, no. First, you have to go back home. And this is what the word said. Go back home and to your people. And then this is what it said. Tell what I have done for you. Then he said this. And tell them of the mercies of the Lord. That's the NIV translation. Very weird wording here, okay? It said mercies of the Lord. It didn't say power, authority, miracles. It said mercies. Do you know, you know who needs mercies? Guilty people. Jesus sent him back to his house, to his people, his family, because there were some issues that were, had taken place in this kid's foundation that the mercies of God needed to fix. Before he could go into what God had destined him to be. When we try to go into what God has destined us to be without first going back and allowing the mercies of God to heal and fix wounds that have been put inside of us from our foundation, we start building these things in, for the Lord, but they crumble underneath our feet because if you know anything about construction, a house with a broken foundation becomes valueless at some point. So God told this guy, he said, before you go, go and... And get, do what you're destined to do. You've got to go deal with some family issues. Go back home. And so that lets me know this. What had happened to him at home, not what he did. It wasn't his behavior. Because Jesus told him to go tell the people in his house the mercy of the Lord. So it was family members that the enemy would have used in his life to open up doors and wounds for the demonic attack or the demonic things he was dealing with in his future. And so what this is called is, these are called mother and father wounds. Now, we're going to go into this in just a minute, but before we get there, you need to know something. That no matter how many demonic spirits were in this kid, they could not keep him from running to Jesus and worshiping the Lord. Man, you got to understand, that's amazing. That is amazing that... 2000s, what legions, theologians, 2000 demons coming against this kid's life could not keep him from running to Jesus. The gentleman I was telling you about, it was, it's honestly, I can say, of all the men I've known in my life and watched as an adult, life, having what I would say the most demonic influence in his life, I watched him run to this altar multiple times and multiple times and multiple times. They could not keep him from coming to Jesus. But I can tell you this. If you come to Jesus and worship Jesus, but you get up and walk out and don't allow or recognize or know that God needs to heal the wounds while you're here, you'll walk out with the same wounds you came in with. Amen. And so these are Kairos moments because God has so much in store for you. But we have to allow God to go back into our past and be willing to fix some things in our foundation. You know, we all come from trauma. I don't care how good your mother and your father was. I don't care how amazing you feel like privilege you came into. We all come from trauma because that's the trap and the attack of the enemy. I can use myself as an example. Nobody loves my daughters more than I do. Nobody. I love those girls. There's nothing I wouldn't do. I care about them greatly and I care about their future. I'm worth $2 million if I die. That's why I don't let Jennifer cook. <laughs> but I have that and I pay that monthly bill because I want to make sure they have a great future ahead. I love them. And I try, I do. One of my major goals every day to get up is to be the best son of God I can be, the best husband to Jennifer I can be, and be the best father to those three girls I can possibly be. But let me tell you about a story a few years ago. I was working on a house. Some of you I've shared this with. 
I was working. We're flipping houses. I was working. I was trying to get soffit. And it was in August, and it was so hot, and I was so tired and trying to hurry because I needed, we were getting ready to give away backpacks down the road. Uh, to, we were going to give out 350 backpacks to families with school supplies and stuff. And so I needed to be working on that, but I also needed to get this house flipped. And so we, I was working out frustrated, but my oldest daughter, she loves to help, and she loves to do things. What she, feel like, she feels like she's doing these things for the Lord, and she loves helping me do the things that I'm called to do for the Lord. And so she was like, Dad, while you're doing that, I'll go pack all the backpacks with school supplies, which is a pretty big deal. I mean, 350 backpacks, colors in every one, glue in every one, pencils in every one. Then got to separate for boys and girls and colors and ages. And, and, and so she got up that day when I got up to work on the house. She got up that day to work on those backpacks. And it was getting late in the evening, and I was hot, and I was frustrated, and I was tired, and I was stressed, and I was having all these crazy thoughts in my head about, I don't need to be doing this, I need to be doing that, and then, yeah, yeah, and I was working myself up into a mess, and she come running outside and said, Dad, Dad, come look, I got it all done. Come on, come and look, Dad, hurry. And I said, baby, I'm busy, I'll be in there a minute, I'll be, just stop. And when I did, I saw it. I don't know if it was physical, what I saw, but I saw it in her eyes. The twinkle was gone. But what was physical, the smile on her face disappeared. And I knew that I, what I had just done cut her. She was doing what she thought would please me. And it did. But my response to that was a wound. And so I jumped off that ladder, ran up to her. I was like, I'm so sorry, baby. I'm hot. I'm tired. I tried to explain to her. And let me tell you something. Explanation does not heal one. If I tell you, if I walk up to you and take a knife and cut your arm, and I say, well, the reason why that happened is because this metal's super sharp and your skin is super tender, and when I pull it down, it, se it separates the, it doesn't heal it. And I begged and I apologized. I was like, kid, I'm so sorry. And she's like, it's okay, Dad, it's okay. And so for the next three days, me being me, I went to Walmart and bought her toys. I took her to get ice cream. I did everything to try to bribe this pain away. But she kept saying, Dad, it's okay, it's okay. But I could see it. And the smile wasn't back. The pride of her doing something that mattered to me wasn't back. And so about three days into it, I get up in my, our back deck. I was praying before the Lord about 5 a.m. And I was like, God, how do I heal this? How do I fix this? How do I work this out? How can I help her? And God told me, I was saying, God, how do I fix this? And he said, you can't. And I got mad. And I said, how dare you give me a kid? That, that's, that is that perfect when you know I'm this messed up. And I got mad, and I was giving it to God. I said, like, it's your fault. It's not mine. You did it. I, you knew I was, I get angry. You knew I get frustrated. And you gave her to me. And when I said that, I said, God, you got to heal her. And God stopped and he says, you're right. You can't heal her. He said, I can. And if you could, she will never need to know me as a healer. And so I gave her you so that she can come to me and get what she needs. So let me tell you why we're born into families like we are. Because although God's plan for you was to be born into a family that the dad served the Lord and worships God and the mother served the Lord and they want to raise children that serve the Lord and worship God. That's God's plan. The truth is, very few of us start out right in God's plan. And so, in a perfect world, that's what would happen. They would teach it. And in a perfect world, the relationship that you have with your dad would represent in the future what your relationship with God will be. And this is the truth. Psychologically, they prove it. That the relationship that you have with your earthly father is, in, is in, a, in, a, in response with the way you perceive God. We all see God through the filters of who our earthly dad is. And the problem with it is, is if you didn't have a dad, you're looking through the absent God filter. If you had an emotionally disconnected dad, you're looking through a filter that God doesn't really care about what you go through. He's there, but he's there. If you had an abusive dad, a strict dad, this determines our view of God. So why was this kid demon-possessed? 
He was demon possessed because he was born into a broken family with a broken mom and dad. And wounds happen even to the best of fathers and mothers, to children. And this is the truth. We're all born into family drama. Even if it was perceived. Let me tell you one of my family dramas, okay? Um, when I got out of Bible college, came to work for my dad, he was hard on me. He was very hard on me. All the other staff got to do cool stuff, man. He gave me the bad jobs, all right? And instead of me understanding he's training me for ministry that's far above the level he's at, I was looking at, you're picking on me. And that was back when we had a church out over the river, and I'd done, been through Bible college. I was the only member of his staff that had been to Bible college. And I got toilet duty, and I got clean church duty, and I got all the duties that nobody wants the duties. And I thought that this is him picking on me. He gave everybody lots of keys. I got one. And I was his son. Not only that, I was the only person on his staff he didn't pay. He told me, when the church can't run without you, we'll pay you. So for three years, I worked for him and never got a dime. I had to work construction at night to pay my bills. And I had one key. And so every time I had to go to the church or to the school, we had a school, I had to call somebody to let me in. And it was my dad's church. Like, you don't even trust me. Until finally came a day that I went and stuck that key in the door because I couldn't get in anything else. And it was the master key to everything. I only needed one key. All right? It's amazing how the devil will cause you to perceive even when things aren't the way they are. Because he knows if he can mess up the foundation, the whole house will be messed up. And this kid could not go on to be what God had called him to be until he was willing to go back and deal with the foundation issues of his people and the ones that had messed up and the ones that did do wrong because it said go back and teach the mercies, making reference to, yes, I know your parents made mistakes and I, yes, I know your parents were wrong and yes, I know, but the thing about it is God still let it take place. So I want to share with you just a minute and I don't mean this to be odd and real, but we're going to close in a way. We're going to, I want to make it make sense, but we've got to talk about a couple things here. One, whether you believe it or not, you were born into a family, and you were born into a family of humans. Unless you're a dog in here today, you had human parents. And God loved your parents, but they were born into a fallen world. And they were as broken as anyone else on the planet had ever been. And because you were born into a human family, we have family traumas. What family traumas do is they cut and hurt. And when these aren't dealt with, they become wounds. And two major factors in our lives of fulfilling all that God has called us to do and actually being free is us going back and dealing with mother wounds and father wounds. And so today I want to break down and try to explain what maybe some of those are. Every one of us in here have father wounds. You say, well, Dad, Cricket, I had a great dad. I've got to be honest with you, I'm trying to be the best dad I could ever be to my girls. And I look at them and see they have father wounds already in them. Not because I'm a bad, I don't love them, Dad. It's because I'm messed up too. You may have had a real monster dad that was addicted and abusive and I'm here to tell you, if you don't know that you have father wounds, then you're never going to address your father wounds. And the truth is this. The Bible says the truth will set you free. That scripture is just not about the Bible. It is. The word of God will set you free. But you also recognizing the truth of your circumstances so you can apply the word of God to them will determine whether or not you're free. And so we've got adults walking through their whole life not willing to deal with truth from family traumas and applying what the Word of God and the truth that the God has to it to fix it. So we walk around with fake facades and we walk around trying to be tough and strong, walk around not getting to be what God created you to be. This kid could not change the world until he was in his right mind, dealt with his family drama, 
And then it says, all the people were amazed. The enemy tries to convince us that our family wounds are shameful and they have to be hid or dealt with or we just got to get over them. No, they got to be healed. So father wounds look like this. All right. Uh, in relationship, what happens is when you're born into a, fa- a family that has trauma issues, trauma relationships become normal. You can be living life thinking it's normal, not recognizing that you're living wounded. All right? So what we have to do in life is we have to recognize what the enemy's trying to use in our life, address it, and then be able to go forward with what God has for us. Number one way the enemies come against us is father wounds. Father wounds can happen in any kind of a way that the devil wants to choose to perceive it to you. But I can tell you this. If you had an absent father, you have a father wound. You say, well, Craig, you're judging me. Absolutely I am because I know the devil. If your father was absent, you're wounded. He did it. The devil wounded you. If you had an a, a abusive father, if you had a, a strict father, the devil tried to cause you to perceive it in a way. I've never met anyone that didn't have... This is what a father wound is. God made you to have four basic needs, and there's nothing you can do in life without these four basic needs being met. They must be met, and if they're not met, then there's a wound inside of us, and those are called the father wounds. The first need you have is you need presence in your life. God designed you to have presence, and you can never be okay in this life unless you have the presence of a father. Well, you say, well, Cricket, then why didn't God keep my father around? Because his real plan was that he's the real father, and he wants to be in your life for your whole life. But the problem with it is we look at God through this father filter, and because dad wasn't there or dad didn't show up or dad let us down, we put that same filter on God, and so that need for presence can't be met. Then there's the provision. Maybe a father didn't provide or or support or take care of the family like you have this desire because you want security. God built us here with a great need for security in our life. And God built us here for him to be that security. But when a father on this earth doesn't support or doesn't provide, we come up and we have a wound of, of provision in our life. And so therefore, we will go anywhere or chase anything to try to get that met. But I'm here to say, you can never meet that need unless God the Father does it. Then there's protection. Now, I had some friends in high school that had the cool dad. Y'all ever had those? that Their dad let them do whatever. He even bought beer for them. All right, those are what I call the permissive dads. All right, the permissive dad wound is a wound that will really destroy your life because, see, dads are supposed to protect you, put up boundaries, and keep wolves out and keep you in so that you can be safe. But when fathers don't do this, the Bible says David was one of these kind of fathers. In 2 Samuel 18, David had a son that David did not tell his kids no anywhere in the story of his life. He, he didn't stand He was a very permissive dad. Let them do what they want when they wanted to. And when he did it, one of his sons rose up and said, I want my sister and I want to sleep with her. And so David didn't stop it. He could have stepped in right there and stopped it, but he didn't. So the brother raped his sister. The other brother got mad. And he was waiting for dad to step up and do something about it, but dad didn't. So he decided, I'm going to take matters into my own hand. And so David's son Absalom killed his brother. And David got mad about it. And Absalom said he ran off, and, but David got to thinking, all right, my son that's dead is gone. I at least want to have a relationship with him. He's still here. So he, again, didn't address any of the wrong and brought Absalom back into the castle. But he said this, I want him to live in my house, but he cannot see my face. And so for two years, Absalom lived in David's castle, but he could not come and see the father's face. So there was a dad there, but he wasn't involved. Another wound. Then what took place was that left a door open for the enemy to begin to infect. And Absalom decided, well, if he's not going to do what's right, I will. And he rose up to be king. And in 2 Samuel 18, chapter 2, is one of the saddest stories in the Bible to me. All the old men of Israel came with David. All the young men that had been wounded by the old men gathered with Absalom. And it said this, there came to be a great war in a field. It said many died by the hand of the sword in that field. But then it says this, many more died in the woods. They weren't even supposed to be in the woods. Why were they in the woods? Because we had young men that had father wounds that were living in places and fighting battles that they shouldn't have been fighting in the woods. Didn't say that they were killed by soldiers. They died in the woods. 
There's men dying in the woods of addiction, dying in the woods of, you know, alcoholism. There's, we're dying because what happened with father wounds. The Bible says Absalom, he even died in the woods. His hair got caught in a tree. And his, so what was going on in his head was what drove him to a place of not fulfilling. He was born a prince, but he died a traitor. And the Bible says that they rode up and they shot him with an arrow in the heart. These things, guys, all came from a father wound. Because a father let him do whatever he wanted to do. Maybe you had a dad that was going to put down the law because his dad put down the law. What I'm saying all this is everybody needs to understand there are such things called father wounds. And if you don't understand and address it, you're never going to go to fix it. Let me explain what it is. Number four is a need that God put in each one of us is this. It says a child needs praise. If your father never praised you, told you you were proud of you, told you that, man, you, can, you are everything, even if you never do nothing that pleases him, then you have a father wound. Jesus, in Matthew 3.17, showed up on the scene. We don't know anything he'd ever done before. He just walked up and went to church. And the Bible says that the presence of God showed up and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God answered all four of these needs for Jesus right then. He showed up and he said, I love you. I accept you. And I have a plan for you. This is your identity. And you're doing a great job. That's what we need. But when we don't get it from an earthly father, you have a wound. Now, I say that because a lot of us understand these are the, the damages caused by father wounds. Number one, low self-esteem. Number two, and I'm not got time to go into all the anger, depression, and anxiety are allowed to come into your life through a father wound. Another, rigid boundaries. When you have to have it this way, it's a father wound. Another father wound is low, loose boundaries. Poor choices in relationships, not necessarily romantic relationships, but you build relationships with people that honestly live a level, level, lower level of life than you know you're to be living. It's a, wound, it's a proof of a father wound. And then the cycle of abuse. In other words, if you're just like your father, you get angry just like your father. You know how I know my daughter has got a wound? Because you know what her first emotion is? Anger. That's her first go-to. That's my fault. But I've determined I can't heal it, but I can keep her in front of the one that can until he does. So those are father wounds. Let's talk real quick about mother wounds because this is one that gets overlooked, and a lot of times we think they're the same thing. These are reasons. You know you have a father wound if, one, he was frequently absent. There's no way around it. If, you were, if he was emotionally absent or abusive, if he was highly critical of you and constantly disapproval of disapproving of your actions, choices, and behaviors, if he withheld food, love, or essentials as a form of punishment, if he was physically abusive, you have a father wound. Next is the mother wound. It's totally different than a father wound. A father wound is something you didn't get. A mother wound is a wound that has happened in your mother that was never dealt with and healed, and it's passed on to the next generation. When your mother has been through trauma and it wasn't dealt with. Or her mother had been through trauma and it wasn't dealt with. And this is all psychologically proven. You can go back and you can do your research as well. But if they don't deal with their trauma, it will be passed on to you. It's like this. If your mother was emotionally unsupportive, if she was highly critical, or if she had low self-esteem, you do too. It's imprinted, and every seed bears after its own kind. It's not whether or not they did something to you. It's what they allowed to stay unhealed inside of them. You picked up. It's been imprinted on the inside of you. You've been wounded. How she felt about herself is the way you will feel about yourself. The way she deals with relationships will be a way that you deal with relationships. What she believed to be true 
you will have a core connection of your belief systems to be true as well in a mother womb. And you may not even know it, but you're wounded. And when the devil has a wound in your life, he has access to come in and destroy your future. These are some signs that you, your mother had unresolved issues. One, if she wanted to be your best friend instead of a mother, she had a mother one. If she looked to you to meet emotional needs instead of her trying to meet your emotional needs, she had a mother one. If she needed you to solve her problems instead of her solving your problems, she had a mother one. If she try, attempted to try to live her life vicariously through you instead of letting you be who God made you to be, she had a mother one. If incidents would happen where maybe she would keep you home from school one day because she was having a bad day, you have a mother wound. She had a mother wound. And think about it. If she had a mother wound that was unresolved, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to believe me, you have a mother wound too. The danger of that is this. A wound starts with a cut, and it's just an entryway for things that shouldn't be in there to get in and infect the health of your life. What are the signs and effects of a mother wound? Your mother just wasn't there mostly. With the, all right? So these are eight signs in our lives that our wounds of our mothers have been passed down into us. If you're a fixer, if you're an enabler, if you're a rescuer, those come out of mother wounds. Here are the eight signs of a mother wound in my life or in your life. If you have the inability to set a boundary, if people can cross over and come across boundaries that should be set up in your life, there's proof that you have a mother wound in your life. All right? Insecurity with body and physical appearance is proof that you have a mother wound in your life. See... Mothers can be the most positive people in your life. And they can say how great you are and how amazing you are and how super you are. But the truth is kids don't hear what you say about them. They become what you say about you. So when you look in a mirror and you say, I'm too fat, or you know, you're around that and say, I always mess things up. I'm a screw up. I've, you know, I've messed up. That's what they hear. And that's what they become. Codependency in a relationship. If you have to have somebody involved in your life because you can't be alone, you have a mother wound. Inability to, re, uh, re, to, re, inability to relate your emotions or self-soothe in healthy ways. You have, in other words, if your mom had high highs and then she had low lows or you know, there were some days she was on a roller coaster or there were some days that you know, she was just in a moody it wasn't moody, it was wounded. And if she was wounded and she didn't deal with these things, you're wounded. Chronic self-judgment, self-criticism, and comparison is a sign that you have a mother wound. Fear of displeasing your mother or looking to her before you make any major decisions. My wife had major mother wounds. And lots of our major decisions in our life she would call and talk to her mom about before we talked about it at all. And that was a sign they were made. And don't look, I mean, are you talking to your mother about decision more than you do your spouse? Do they have more input in your life than whom you're supposed to be with? Then there's a mother wound. All right? A lack of self-trust. You're always seeking other people's approval for decisions and lifestyles and the way you live. You have a nicer car so people think good about it. You've got to dress nicer. Every decision is determined by what someone else thinks about. That's a mother wound. Now, this is the truth about these things. They will bring you, a mother wound will always bring you into a situation where you will be connected into unhealthy or bad or traumatized relationships. Not even just spouses, but friends as well. Because, see, the devil knows. He's going after these things. Mother wounds, they will kill, cause you to build unhealthy relationships with people. And the Bible says bad companions corrupt good manners. It gives them an... And this is how you know if, you, if you're in a healthy relationship in your marriage then, and you're both healed, then you should be able to expose and work through your trauma and you, you don't have to hide it. You don't got to wait. You can, and you both get better and better as you go forward. But 
unhealthy, wounded people, what they have to do is they build trauma bonds, is what they call it in psychology, and they build relationships, not healthy bonds with people, but they build trauma bonds. In other words, the trauma they've been through is what connects them together, and trauma-bonded relationships always bring more wound and more abuse into your life because healthy people make healthy people, broken people break people, hurt people hurt people, and it becomes a, a constant rotating cycle in our lives to where we keep getting hurt and we keep disappointed and God's not the way you, trauma bond relationships are built is number one love bombing they just pour oh I love you so much I love you so much you're the greatest you're the greatest you're the greatest they flatter flatter flattery but then they go after trust and dependency because trust and dependency once they earn that for you now they can begin to take it in another direction even if they're doing it to try to heal some of their wound I did that as a pastor I, I was so wounded on the side thinking that my value was in what I did. So I love people, love people, love people. And then when they would trust me, I would start trying to get my need met. Then criticism comes. They start picking at the little things about you that they don't like, which breaks you down. And then manipulation comes in. And a lot of sorry it comes in as gaslight. You know what gaslighting is? It's off the 1930s play uh, where um, a husband would lower the gas lights in the house to where they would flicker and the wife would be like, are the lights flicker? And he'd say, no, you must be crazy. And he kept that on until it moved into other things and he finally got her committed. All right. Um, then they move into, you, give it, you start giving up control. They get to start making decisions because you'll do anything just to keep peace. And then once you lose the control and they're just dominating over on you, the addiction, you get addicted to the cycle and every relationship in your life will become that. Now, it takes two people in a relationship like that. One, it takes a wounded, and then two, it takes a, a um, narcissist. Do you know how narcissists are born? Narcissists are born by parents not allowing children to experience emotion. And i got to be honest with you guys. If, I don't, if, I wouldn't have, if God wouldn't have started healing me, I would have had three narcissists right now. When parents don't allow kids to have, experience emotion, don't cry. Stop crying. Stop that. Don't, don't act that way. They, they don't allow them to experience what happens is psychologically. They, they suppress all the emotions on the inside and hold them in so tight that the only emotions they can focus in on or feel are the ones they have so their whole life becomes about them. And then they begin to cause the trauma again. The way as parents, I'm having to learn this because it's not natural for me is when my children do something or they're hurting or they're... We had this expression the other day, one of my daughters got bullied at school about a little boy. And when she came home, I would have normally... That's nothing. Blow it off. That's my personality. Get over it. You're eight years old. Or she's ten. That don't mean nothing. But I'm having to learn. I said, well, how did that make you feel? I had to be able to... I know that had to hurt, kid. What's really going on? Are you okay? Because if I don't let her feel... I'm going to wound her. But then when she feels, then I let her, well, what do you think you ought to do there? I'm creating leaders. Letting them see how they can think through that. And that's not natural for me. I'm having to learn to parent because God set me free and freer. What I'm telling you all this is for this. Every person in this room, your future has been affected by your foundation. I brought all the information out today because I want you to know and recognize whether or not the enemy's had a doorway in your life to keep you at the level of living that you're on. Because God's plan for you is to live and life more abundantly. Now, the way you combat wounds is this. How many of you guys grew up watching G.I. Joe? I'm a G.I. Joe guy. All right, you remember G.I. Joe, the cartoon? I used to watch it every day when I got home from school, and they would play these, the awesome cartoon. Then right at the very end, they would do a PSA. Y'all remember the PSAs? And it would be like, all right, if your building's on fire, or yeah, 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 you call the cops. Uh, and then at the end of it, he would sit up there and goes, now you know. And what's the answer? And knowing is what? Half the battle. See, some people have watched G.I. Yeah, Joe. Would you say, Cricket, why, why are you poking this wound at me? Because this is the truth. Most people on this planet have father wounds. They've never been addressed. You've got father wounds and mother wounds. And the truth of the matter is this. You will go through life hurting and not know why. And so I have to bring to the top what is. If, if I walk up and I touch my knee and it hurts, I think, man, there's something wrong with my knee. If I touch my arm and it hurts, man, there's something wrong with my arm. If I touch my head and 
say it hurts, there's something wrong with my head, I can start thinking there's something wrong with my whole body, but the truth of the matter is I could have the wound on my finger and it could make everything I touch hurt. So if I can un- get you to understand, get you to see that the enemy has come against you before you even had a chance to be able to... Now your job is not to just get over it, but Jesus said, go back home, get with your people and deal with this thing, then they was able to go and the history of this young man was he didn't just change his city. Later when the gospel came back across to his region, five cities on that side of the lake were all radically on fire for Jesus. See, we won't reach our potential to these things. You're healed. You say, well, Cricket, what if I, what if I can't go back? To, you really want me to go? No, I'm just, can I just be blunt with you? I just let, my wife has restraining orders on every member of her family except her brother. We don't let them around her or my kids. I'm not saying you go back and get in person. What I'm saying is this. You got to get this healed on the inside of you. What the devil's trying to do is destroy you. So the way you get it healed first, you recognize the truth will set you free. And it hurts me. I cried 10 times yesterday because as I was trying to evaluate my life, my dad's like, man, I love my dad. Great, man. I was at his house yesterday. I spent every minute I can with him. But the truth is the devil used circumstances and situations in my life to wound me. And those are father wounds. And if I want to ignore them, they're going to stay there and they're going to fester and they're going to infect. And they're going to keep me from being released and be free. I have a great mom. I've got wounds. There are people that have had bad ones. You've got wounds. Well, anybody here, the devil set you up. But if I don't know it, I can't come to the Father and allow Him to heal it. If I don't acknowledge it, I can't ask for God to help me in areas that I need to get His help. So number one, knowing is half the battle. Number two, knowing Him is the rest. You can't fix this. You can't go back and undo what's been done but God can be what you've been missing and lacking the whole time and when you recognize that I'm wounded and I need Jesus I'm wounded and I need God then you come to a place where God can begin to heal and unpack the things that the enemy has snuck into your life through foundational issues and kept you bound my issue while I'm saying this I stay in such shame and we just kept, keep trying to put shame on me for mistakes I've made with my daughters because they deserve a much better dad than me and I'm not going to accept that shame because what I'm going to do is every time I'm shameful I'm going to say girls your daddy is getting better but I want to introduce you to your father who's doing the work in me and he will heal what I've done in you and I've asked my daughter to forgive me. Yesterday on the phone, I said, girls, I, I want you to forgive me. Areas that I spoke, I was hateful, I was mean, or maybe I wasn't there, I didn't give attention to it because I want you to know God will forgive you for anything in your life. And he has. Today, there are wounds, and I want to just ask you, do you want to keep them? Do you want them to stay there? Do you want to keep affecting them? I don't believe that. I don't know anybody that likes to be wounded except the fact that sometimes our wounds feel better than we're afraid to let heal and come in. We're afraid if people actually see that we're wounded, maybe, maybe they're going to think less of us. Let me tell you a secret. You're not fooling anybody except yourself. The devil will use familiar spirits to try to comfort you, but you're still broken and you're still wounded. But God's going to heal. So I want to do this. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes real quick. We're going to deal with this father wound first. Now, I don't know. Like I say, I'm glad we're at a church that we just don't believe in praying over things. We also believe in processing things. And so I'm glad we have a church that I'm just not going to pray and I'm going to expect everything in your life to be fixed right now. We also have a freedom class every Wednesday night. And this week they dealt with father wounds and mother wounds because, see, we get healed as we go together. 
The Bible says that when we come together, confessing our faults one to another, that's not sin, that's weaknesses and brokenness in our life. And it says, and you will be healed. We have plans and programs to, to help you get there. Katrina is our freedom class teacher. We got Celebrate Recovery. You can call and you can counsel with Ms. Doris. We got ways if you're here. It may not happen instantaneously in you. I got to be honest with you, I'm 47. And I had a Kairos moment yesterday about not feeling shameful about breaking my daughters. But bringing my daughters to him and releasing them to him because he's the good father. But you've got a father wound, and I want to ask God to heal that thing today. Say, okay, I don't know if I got a father wound. I want you to take just a minute. I want you to think. And remember a time where you were hurt, you were disappointed, you were let down, you were abandoned, or you were wrongfully and heartfully corrected by your earthly father. Do you remember a time that when you think of it, it wounds. And I want you to simply ask this, say, Father, where were you at when that happened? Now listen. Look at me just for a second. Can I ask you this question? Did anybody in here at the Lord say, I was right there with you? Let me tell you a story about my wife. My wife was telling me when she was abused, she was beaten one day. And she was balled up in a closet, a corner of her room crying at about the age of eight. And she said, when we started going through the process of healing father, mother wounds, she said that she felt so alone there. And she could remember balled up in that corner in her room. And when we were going through it, Jennifer asked, God, where were you at when this was taking place? And God told her I was right there. And God showed her that he was sitting right beside her. And the same tears she had coming down in her eyes, he had coming down his. Because the Father's presence has never left you. Your earthly dad may have bailed, but your Father has always been there. And if he let you go through it, you need to understand this. When you understand who your real Father is, the reason why he let that take place was because he lets your pain become purpose. Anytime God's in the middle of pain, there's purpose. And so you need to start asking God, God, where were you when my dad walked out the door? God, where were you when my dad was drunk and said those things? God, where were you? Because if God was there, that pain now is not supposed to cripple you. It is supposed to bring purpose into your life for you to be able to fulfill what God's put you here to do. Had he not have been broken and went back home to deal with it, he would have never changed this city or even that side of the country because he would have kept his life built on fractured foundations. It starts with the family matters. Now some of us may need to call and talk to our parents, but some of those, health, those relationships ain't healthy. So you go to your real father. Some of our fathers aren't even here. Even, see, there's fathers that have died on battlefields. And there's fathers that lied, died in the line of duties. And they're honorable fathers. But the devil will still come and tell you that you didn't have this, so you're lacking now. No, you have it. God is your answer. So once you know there's a wound, next you know who can fix the wound. And you come to your heavenly father, and he will heal. And then all the trauma that's been put on you, we have to forgive. Now, this is hard. Because some of the things our families have done to us are in reproach. But I'm not saying you go to them and forgive them. There was a time Jesus was hanging on a cross and they had drove nails through his hands and nails through his feet. This kid was told to go to his house and tell of the mercies of the Lord. Jesus didn't tell him for him to go and ask his family for or him to forgive his family. He said, go tell them about the mercies of the Lord. You know what that looks like? Jesus was hanging on a cross. He knew who drove the nails. And he said this, Father, forgive them. They did not realize what they were doing. And so that's how we begin to heal. That's maybe where you've got to be today. You maybe have been controlled by mother wounds. Maybe you've been dealing with father wounds. But it simply says this, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they did to me. And the way it's hurt me. 
and the way it's bound me and the change it's put in my life. But today I want to be free. And I ask you to release the bonds. Let's pray. Say, Father, forgive them. They don't know how bad they hurt me. But God, you do. And they can't heal me. But I ask you, God, to heal this on the inside of me and make what the enemy has meant for harm become purpose in my life. Release the chains of guilt, shame, self, low self-esteem, anger, depression. Release the chains right now. God, I ask you to break them off of me so I can be free to do what you have purposed me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to say this. There's nothing like the Father's love. But the reason why God put a Father image on earth that we're supposed to look at our Heavenly Father through the filter is because sometimes you need a touch. If you're here today, we've got some spiritual fathers in this place. Maybe you've never been hugged and heard a father say, I love you. And I'm here to tell you, until that wound is fixed, it's going to affect everywhere you go. That finger is going to hurt everything you touch. If you would, if you're there, say, Cricket, I need a father's hug. I've never had one. Or if you've never had a mother's hug or an embrace, I'm telling you, there's nothing in the world like it. You were born to have it. And I want to make available to you, Sister Vashta, if you'll come up. Greg, if you'll come up. I trust these two guys. I can't say there's anything in them that I've seen questionable in any way. But if you need a father's hug or you need a mother's hug, I'm going to ask them to stand in proxy for one maybe you never had. But God wants you to feel an embrace of a loving father and a loving mother to be able to heal parts of those wounds on the inside of you. So if you don't need that, that's okay. I got hugs from my mom. My dad kissed me on my forehead every day of my life. I can remember till I went to college. And I was telling him to quit. So some people don't need that. But some people do. So I want to make, I remember when I was at a Kairos moment with my wife. And I had not realized her mother had never hugged her. And I watched her go forward. And I have a godly, a spiritual mother hug her. And what it released inside of her changed the way she hugged my children. I'm so thankful for spiritual mothers and fathers in our lives because they can heal. God can use them to heal what the enemy's tried to destroy. So Leah's going to play a song. If you're good, goodbye. If you need a touch, I want to make it available to you. Amen. So go ahead, Miss Leah. Lead us and you're dismissed. Freedom is